Ann Christensen, and I'm going to uh, present a short lecture that helps to set up the rate of decrease um, in the context of our class. So I'll say a little bit about Unit 1 and then focus mostly on um, the poem. Soldiers leave home to fight wars, and when they return, they often experience radically changed home fronts where they no longer fit in. Of course, their experiences change them, too. Returning soldiers today, and maybe some of you have family members who've served in different wars. Um, let's see, how can I say this? That's better. Um, you know, talk about their inability to communicate what they have seen and done in war. Um, but changes and sometimes horrors happen to their families in their absence, too. This is a gap we'll focus on in Unit 1, experience and representing that experience, so the gap between those, and just the spaces that form between people. To what extent is absence to blame for those changes? In this unit, we will begin to explore the Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's dramatization of divided families and gaps by way of the tragic register of violence, empire building, rape, conspiracy and assassination? How does Shakespeare use military and imperial language and events to characterize domestic problems and dissolutions? How are ideas of masculinity and femininity associated with places or placelessness, interiors and exteriors, home and travel, peace and war? In the first work, the long narrative poem, <clears throat> excuse me, The Rape of Lucrece, the Roman military is away fighting to uh, to conquer Ardia. Uh, Colatine, the king's son, oh, no, that's right. Oh, right, sorry. Colatine and the king's son, Tarquin, and other upper-ranking men are, are away at that siege. But Tarquin, who's the prince, leaves the camp and enters Caladium, the home of Colatine and Lucrece, under the auspices of hospitality. He comes and is like, you know, I'm here, you know, you have to put me up. He rapes the matron of the household, Lucrece. When husband and wife finally reunite in their home, their alienation is palpable. Both stood like old acquaintance in a trance, met far from home, wondering each other's chance. Shakespeare draws attention to the military and imperial context for separation by setting the poem in Rome during the imperial expansion and depicting Caesar <clears throat> in, and Julius Caesar as a cosmopolitan conqueror. So we'll talk more about those contexts. I'll just mention now, too, that setting is very important in both of these pieces. In fact, your first formal paper will focus on setting. So you may attend to, lo to locations and background as you begin to read. Both works in this unit takes pains to specify location and mention place names and they sort of look to or you know off the page or off the stage to other significant locales. A classic one in um, this poem is that Lucrece has this whole long set piece on the fall of Troy which is not happening in her time. Um, so other aspects of setting, they include, na they present nature and civilization, kind of an interesting su and surprising counterpoints. Um, for example, the rape of Lucrece takes place almost, almost exclusively inside a home, but the poem is full of imagery, imagery from the natural world, flowers, birds, and so on. Um, and Julius Caesar moves from the streets to the capital to tents and battlefields, um, so as we'll discover, setting extends beyond where events take place to include culture broadly construed. And so now I'll shift to the rape of Lucrece itself. The poem is a very heavy with rhetoric and poetic language that can be put offish to modern readers. That is, it sounds flowery or fake. So I want to say a few things about that. I totally get that. Um, someone just pulled up in my driveway and is talking outside my door, so we'll just ignore them. Writers in early modern England loved and appreciated verbal artifice. Um, and though a poet like Sir Philip Sidney um, could claim that his muse cajoled him to look in, my, look in thy heart and write, most writers, in fact, looked outside to the classics, the Bible, and other writers' techniques. So many of you are creative writers. 
and aren't taught, um, you know, write what you know and all that. And that's probably great advice. But in this period, these highly educated university guys um, who circulated poems like this, uh, they knew all these stories already, and they imitated them. So they wanted to show off to some extent. That's just part of what they were doing. That doesn't mean, just because the rhetoric is so, and you'll see it's pretty over the top in some cases, that doesn't mean that the story doesn't have some pathos to it because it just totally does. A book that I love, uh, Heather Dubrow's book Captive Victors, Shakespeare's narrative poems and sonnets, does a great job of explaining how Shakespeare uses poetic devices and I'll talk about some of those. Um, so the narrative poems are include um, another poem that Shakespeare wrote right before this one and it's Venus and Adonis, another famous kind of story. That one's a, a myth. Um, Anyway, so they're both super flowery. Um, but um, Dabro's book, Captive Victors, takes the title from a line from this poem that's an oxymoron. Tarquin is, after he rapes Lucrece, a captive victor that hath lost in gain. That's line 730. In other words, his win is a loss. His loss in, is a gain. Getting what he wanted makes him sick. And obviously ruins Lucrece's life. We will look at the prevalence of this trope, oxymoron, and related ones, including pun and paradox, and analyze how they function to convey the core oppositions and ironies in the poem. This is a super irony, ironic poem. Um, and we'll say more about that. Um, so on the, in, on the idea of gaps, the poem provides an argument or summary in prose at the beginning. Um, and the poem proper begins in Medius Racer, in the middle of things with Tarquin already riding madly to Caladium. So the action takes place there at the home of Collatine and Lucrece and finally opens up to the Roman streets. Absence, loss, and separation, versions of our theme of gaps, are common conditions in the world of this poem. Separated spouses and divided households seem to be the norm as Lucrece's husband, his general Tarquin, and other Roman men have been away from Rome to besiege Ardea. The home seems to be a place of repose and settlement, but in fact leaves Lucrece vulnerable. Um, she's too protected, perhaps, too innocent to read the face of, of a criminal that comes to her door in the prince. Um, furthermore, she's often described in terms of houses, rooms, um, and other architectural imagery. Lucrece speaks of her lost chastity, a gap in her own kind of personality. Movement, action, and travel, this kind of mobility seems to define men in contrast to Lucrece's radical enclosure within the home. There are imagery patterns you can start to follow right away, um, and that just makes the reading more pleasurable and uh, gives you a way in. These themes, uh, these images advance the themes of gaps between home and travel, inside and outside, security and danger, and a lot of these seemingly polar opposites wind up blurring and not being so opposite. So, for example, uh, sea, water, and tide images are used to convey different forces at different points in the story. <clears throat> Lucrece describes her tears, sighs, and groans like a troubled ocean. And Tarquin uh, speaks of his own lust and power as my uncontrollable tide that turns not, but swells higher. Other types of imagery that you can pay attention to and just kind of analyze and follow all along include military terms, fortresses, invasion, citadel, fort, and weapons, prison and enclosure imagery, clo cloisters, closets, and cages. Um, domestic life, locks, doors, hospitality, again, closets, economic language, which sometimes is called econolingua. Um, there's <clears throat> lots of references to treasure, possession, money, property. And again, almost always these images don't aren't super obvious. It's not just one thing. So it's used as a metaphor. So at one point, um, I think Collatine is called the hopeless merchant of his loss, and it seems like he, Lucrece is just his mere possession, but I don't think it, the poem, I don't think it ends that way. Anyway, 
Um, there's images of art and language and writing and rhetoric. So there's like pens and artists in the poem. Um, light and dark, day and night, and various associations with all of those. Um, there's lots of references to the political realm, sometimes literally, sometimes metaphorically. Rebel, king, government, and misgovernment. Um, okay. There are lots of interesting literary devices, again, back to that first point, that's, that seem, they're so poetic and so literary that they feel sort of fake, but I think once we really get into them, you'll, they really truly do, they're crucial to the poem. Um, and I'll just speak about a couple of them now. Uh, the, uh, the Blazon, and many of you are familiar with that, um, from Sonnets, like a kind of a classic thing would be to describe the beloved, and many, many love songs do this, and talk about someone, you know, the beloved's, you know, whatever, ivory neck and rosy cheeks and cherry something, a lips or something. Um, there's a, 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 a hysterical um, painting of, like a literalization of those, I'll put it up on the website where it shows like, this kind of really grotesque woman with all these weird things on her face. Anyway, so normally that's the beloved, the beautiful body parts. They're used in love sonnets. A famous example is the gorgeous biblical Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, which I have um, linked in our exploration for further exploration folder. And that is significantly, I think, spoken in the voice of a dark-skinned woman praising her male beloved's body. He's like a gazelle. Anyway, it's super gorgeous. And the eroticism of that poem, of that song, worried the church a lot. So they tried to downplay it as just a metaphor for people marrying the church or Christ marrying people or something. But it's really sexy. Um, Shakespeare plays around with that literary tradition in his sonnet 130. That's the funny one. My mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. That seems to say, like, I can use these fanciful images, but my girlfriend is a real woman. In The Rape of Lucrece, the blazon is really eerie and scary. It occurs, uh, describes the sleeping figure of Lucrece right before Tarquin rapes her. And also, interestingly, the narrator and Tarquin seem to merge at that point. It's just hard to tell who's speaking. There's lots of examples of other kinds of literary language, again, that, that makes, I think, that are striking, fresh, and defamiliarizing. So something you'd normally think of then suddenly explodes in this interesting way. One of my favorite ones is that Shakespeare makes verbs out of nouns. So a word like coffers, a coffer is like a treasure chest or a barn, and, and the word barn become verbs instead of nouns. Um, so another example is that uh, the person stories, he storied me instead of he told me a story or he narrated. Um, there's hyphenated terms that come from the classical, uh, you know, swift-footed Mercury, um, and they're jarring. So in Rape of, or in Venus and Adonis, he has he calls Venus sick-thoughted Venus, and it's kind of like weird. You have to really unpack that. Tarquin um, is described as lust-breathed Tarquin, and there's a phrase unlooked for evil. And there's a phrase, cursed, blessed, that's line 866, which is also an oxymoron. There's also puns, which we think of as funny, but they're not always funny. They're just kind of sophisticated wordplay. And one of them is line 506, 509, is falcon, the bird, and falcon, it's spelled falchion, which is a kind of sword. <clears throat> so there, and there's a different, there's a number of um, items that I refer to in the For Further Exploration folder that we may look at in class. They include um, a critical study of the way that both Tarquin and Lucrece engage in self-divided monologues. It's by Ian Donaldson. It's called A Theme for Disputation. It's just a short article, about 15 pages, from his book, The Rapes of Lucretia, A Myth and Its Transformations, that came out in 1982. His thesis explores our theme of separation by looking at the inner division um, uh, or a kind of separation from the self in both Lucrece and Tarquin. I also have a gallery of paintings and other visual representations of the Tarquin and Lucrece slash founding of the Roman Republic story. 
um, which we'll use in one of the online assignments. In addition, I provide a one-page supplement to oops, my Amazon package uh, will arrive. I just got a ding. Sorry. Um, ah, okay, that page has more information about literary devices such as oxymoron. I also link you to that biblical song of songs uh, to illustrate the literary device of the blazon. Um, there are some other articles and resources too. So that's stuff to kind of just get you going for the context of the poem. And I, again, it is long. As I said in my other lecture and I said in my email, the best thing to do is listen to the LibriVox recording and um, just follow along with your printed out PDF and just simply mark it up. Okay. Um, great. Thanks. See you soon. Hey, Wills. Okay.